This is Armenia Unlocked, a weekly edition from CivilNet, with your host and executive producer, Susanna Petrosian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Armenia Unlocked, a podcast by CivilNet TV where we take a quick look at what happens in Armenia and why. Joining me on the show today from Washington, D.C. is Emil Sanamian, a journalist focusing on Armenia and the neighborhood. Emil is also a fellow at the Institute of Armenia Studies at the University of Southern California. Hi, Emil. Thanks for joining us today. Hello, my pleasure. Now that Armenia's parliamentary elections are over, let's try to unpack Armenia-Russian relations in this new era. Russian President Vladimir Putin, or any top Russian official, has yet to congratulate Pashinyan on his huge victory during parliamentary elections on December 9. Are onlookers exaggerating the implications, or is this normal? Uh, Well, this is not normal as far as uh, Russia-Armenia relations. If we look at uh, the previous election, in uh, even the very last election when Nikol Pashinyan was elected by parliament, he was congratulated by Putin. Uh, Prior to that, uh, we had uh, the elections 2017 and Sir Sarkisyan was congratulated the next day after the election. So this is not normal. So there is some kind of an issue uh, between Putin and Pashinyan. Uh, I think uh, the the one issue that has been standing out is uh, Kucharian's arrest. I think that's a primarily primary irritant right now between uh, Armenia and Russia. Uh, last summer, as you will recall, in late July after Kucharian was arrested, there was a very tough statement issued by Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, since then, Lavrov has remained sort of uh, a very kind of a, a, a cautious a commentator on Armenian events. Um, Prior to that, Lavrov had a very good working relationship with the former Armenian foreign minister, Nalbandian, but uh, currently it seems like there is not a good channel uh, between the current Armenian government and the Russian government, and that, of course, can have consequences uh, Okay, but But on the other hand, on December 6, Putin announced that Armenia will assume the presidency of the Eurasian Economic Union in 2019. And to backtrack a bit, Armenia joined the union with Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan in 2015, following then President Sarsharksyan's abrupt and unpopular decision to turn away from a free trade deal with the European Union. So what is the significance of Putin giving Armenia the presidency here? Well, this has been scheduled years in advance. Uh, mm-hmm. So far, all of the other members of the Eurasian Union have already chaired the Eurasian Union. So Armenia is the only member that hasn't. So this was scheduled uh, about five, well, uh, three years ago when the union was uh, formalized, four years ago almost. So this is not something that that new, um, and this has been pre-scheduled. Uh, as far as uh, Serge Sarkisyan's decision to join the Euro- Eurasian Union, I wouldn't agree that it was an unpopular decision, and it remains actually a popular decision in Armenia. If you look at the recent uh, opinion polls, majority of Armenians, vast majority of Armenians support Eurasian Union membership and uh, want actually more integration with Russia. So that well, uh, that let's say it was a surprise decision for many. It was definitely a surprise decision because the government of Armenia, prior to that, insisted that Eurasian Union membership was not in their interest. Okay. And Armenia and Russia are negotiating gas tariffs as we speak. Let's remember that Armenia receives its gas from the Russian gas giant Gazprom, which owns the natural gas pipeline network within Armenia and holds a monopoly over import and distribution. In the summer of 2015, mass protests broke out in Armenia against a 17% hike in electricity, a price increase that was largely blamed on Russia. What can we expect now and what is being given and taken during these negotiations? Well, uh, normally uh, there is this process that, that happens every three years. Uh, they're, they're renegotiating the price. Uh, it depends the, the price of the natural gas depends on oil prices. So from perspective of uh, the oil price, uh, there's been a climb in oil prices over the past three years, but now they've come, come down again. So the price is roughly where it was three years ago. So from the perspective of the oil price and sort of the, the market price, uh, there shouldn't really be a big push for Russia to raise the price. But uh, if they do that, that would signify that this unhappiness that exists between Putin and Pashinyan is being reflected in sort of the sanction over uh, the gas price. And we already experienced that actually six years ago when uh, um, Serge Sarkisyan was in nego- negotiating the European Union agreement, uh, the Russian government 
uh, hijacked uh, the, the sorry not hijacked uh, jacked up the price uh, for the natural gas and uh, as a result you had you know the effect on the electricity and all of those prices and uh, at the time the Armenian government actually made it kept it secret that the price was raised and only a year or two later they acknowledged that the price was raised so uh, at the time too it was a political politically driven decision and uh, today too it will be a politically driven decision also influenced by market prices, but primarily by politics. And uh, in between, of course, three years ago, after Armenia joined the Eurasian Union, the Russians lowered, substantially lowered the price to one of the lowest uh, it sells, uh, that they sell natural gas at to any of the countries. And uh, it still is at that level. Does the timing matter that it's happening now, or is that also a scheduling issue? It was a scheduling issue. Like I said, three years ago, pre- prior to that, three years ago, they agreed for the, the following three years, uh, the price that exists today, and then now they're supposed to renegotiate it. But of course, uh, what they're offering, clearly they're offering a higher price. That's the indications that I'm um, getting from the news reports and discussions. And uh, that's happening because, like I said, there is a political decision, there is a political suspicion that um, is reflected in lack of congratulations and uh, other, other things. Mm-hmm. Russia also has a military base in Armenia, the 102nd base in Gyumri, uh, one of the largest cities in Armenia. A Russian serviceman from this base has been arrested on charges of murdering a 57-year-old street cleaner on December 2. And this is not the first time that such an incident has taken place. Back in 2015, Valery Permyakov, also a Russian serviceman from the same base, murdered seven members of the Avetisian family. So what happens if one day people wake up and decide they don't want this base in their town anymore? Uh, well, if they do, of course, that will have uh, ramifications for uh, policy uh, in Armenia. So far, I have to say that uh, the reaction of the Armenian government, Mikhail Pashinyan's reaction, has been much more... Um, I actually haven't heard any reaction from Nikol Pashinyan. The government's reaction has been much more uh, reduced than it was, say, over the summer. As you remember, there was this incident with the Russians holding exercises near an Armenian village without giving an adequate warning to the population. Right, in Panik people. village. Right? So at the time, as you remember, Nikol Pashinyan was much more uh, you know, forthright in his uh, reaction and, and being angry about uh, the Russian soldiers' conduct. In this case, I haven't he- heard the reaction. I think it again comes back to the fact that uh, Nikol Pashinyan has really made an effort to kind of uh, develop a nice uh, rapport with, uh, with Vladimir Putin. And it doesn't just include this uh, aspect of this, but also the agreement to send Armenian unit to Syria, to Aleppo, Syria, to demine Aleppo, Syria. And this uh, notion that he aired during uh, the election campaign that the monies that the government will be able to take back from the former uh, sort of corrupt officials or uh, businessmen affiliated with corrupt officials would go primarily for Armenia's defense, and that would mean more purchases of Russian weapons. So uh, overall, Nikol Pashinyan has been trying to kind of establish a good relationship with Putin and not to antagonize Putin, but this one issue regarding to Kocharyan has uh, been sort of a, an issue of principle for uh, Nikol Pashinyan. It seems that it is more important for him to have uh, Kocharyan in prison than many other things. And what is uh, Kocharyan's importance for Putin? Uh, I think uh, the, uh, Putin made it clear that he has this personal relationship with uh, with Kocharyan, but more importantly, I think it, it sets a precedent for uh, Putin uh, that a former president of the former Soviet Republic is being jailed. This is the first time that it's happening, and uh, uh, he seems to take that uh, as a bad precedent. Uh, per, per, perhaps he's thinking of himself when he one day will not be president of Russia and how he might be treated by his successor. I mean, you closely follow Russian media as well. How did they report the elections in Armenia and um, all of the things that have been happening in the last couple months? Well, more most of Russian media has been uh, reporting it matter of fact. Uh, factly, it was not uh, a very uh, sort of deep focus on the election. They, most media I haven't heard actually sending uh, correspondence to Armenia. There was much more interest during the spring than there is now. Uh, but uh, in general, there was this kind of uh, sense of coolness on the official uh, sort of close to Kremlin media of what's happening in Armenia. They were highlighting the fact that the opposition the only opposition party running did not the Republican Party did not get into the parliament, and they were highlighting the fact that uh, you know uh, uh, Nikol Pashinyan is uh, sort of taking control, consolidating control. 
Uh, at the same time, the more of a sort of liberal media, like uh, the few publications that still exist as liberal media in Russia and Russian media, some of them based abroad, uh, they were much more positive about uh, Nikol Pashinyan sort of uh, concluding the revolutionary change in Armenia with this election. And what are the first one, two or three things that Pashinyan needs to do in order to be able to balance this relationship in the long term with its relationship with the West and other neighbors? Well, that's the thing. I mean, there is not a credible Western alternative. We we mentioned the fact that uh, Putin uh, has not congratulated uh, Armenia, or uh, Lavrov hasn't congratulated, but we haven't really heard much from any of the American leadership. Uh, I think its deputy spokesperson of the State Department has been the highest level that we've heard from. So in the absence of this uh, Western interest, uh, American interest primarily, uh, Pushinyan is left with uh, no other uh, choice but to kind of find ways to uh, engage with, uh, with the Russian leadership. So um, it seems like uh, he will, you know, uh, once again have to renegotiate uh, those sort of terms of interaction. So far, uh, what uh, has been the case is that because Pushinyan's focus has been on sort of consolidating power inside and uh, uh, you know, making sure uh, that he's not challenged either by uh, a former ruling party or Kucharyan, uh, it has had a cost on how Armenia interacts with Russia. So, for example, if Serge Sarkisyan uh, was able to keep Armenia out of Syria, uh, out of uh, sending directly supporting Russian actions in Syria, uh, Nikol Pashinyan had to compromise on that, or uh, having to, with the, with some of the weapons purchases uh, under Serge Sarkisyan. Uh, there were, you know, uh, uh, purchases that had to do more with the direct Armenian needs versus what Russian needs are. So uh, the, the, this equilibrium needs to be reestablished between the domestic priorities that Pashinyan has and, the, and those foreign policy priorities with Russia. All right. Thanks, Emil. Thank you. And thank you for listening to this edition of Armenia Unlocked. For more news on this topic and everything else that's going on in Armenia, follow CivilNet on Twitter, Facebook, and at civilnet.am. My name is Susanna Petrosian. You've been enjoying Beirut's music. And special thanks to our podcast producer, Mishag Ghazarian. Mm-hmm.